uh, Ishan and uh, Shankar for a very nice conference they've arranged, and especially for inviting me to speak. Um, I'm going to, uh, there's one word that's not in the uh, abstract that should be there in the title. We'll come to that in a moment. Um, I'd like to talk about three topics today that have preoccupied me for some 15 years or more. Um, the first is the idea of material instability, um, which is um, an intrinsic or constitutive instability, which is quite different from dynamical instabilities uh, that one often sees in fluid and solid mechanics. Um, put generally, a material instability is a stability of homogeneous states. Uh, and that can, uh, those states can give way to structured uh, states such as phase separation, um, shear bands, and so forth, strain localization. That's the first idea. The second idea is one of uh, dissipation potentials, uh, which I came upon some over, a little over five years ago and have been preoccupied with, and I hope to convince you of the uh, utility of that idea. But finally, uh, much more recent, is the idea of length scale or gradient effects in continua. Uh, we can talk about, we could also say size effects. So I'm going to uh, try to combine all those ideas. Uh, when I cite myself, um, I'll use uh, my initials um, to do that. And I would like to acknowledge, uh, acknowledge collaborators and some institutions that have uh, some supported me uh, during some of this work. <coughs> so here's a brief uh, mathematical background. I want to talk about um, the work of Dominique Edelin on dissipation potentials and the idea of nonlinear Onsager symmetry and uh, some applications to viscoplastic constitutive equations and drag laws. I should mention that most of these ideas are fairly familiar in the, to some people who work in solid mechanics. Uh, they haven't quite penetrated the field of fluid mechanics. And if uh, one of the things I'd like to achieve is, uh, is to perhaps encourage some of you to look at some of the ideas, some of you who work in complex fluids. Um, I'll talk about some elastic analogies, extremum principles, and variational methods. And uh, the, the real focus of the talk is the higher gradient uh, models to regularize uh, short wavelength or Hadamard instabilities of the mu of I model. I want to thank Professor Kakar for giving a, a nice introduction to this model so it'll make my task a little bit easier. And finally, uh, uh, some things about alternative models at the end. Um, okay, what's the idea of dissipation potentials? Well, many physical systems are largely dissipative. They don't store any energy. They have no elastic effects. And uh, those systems can be characterized in the notation of Onsager by forces, uh, that, uh, an n-dimensional vector of forces that uh, have conjugate fluxes, uh, forces denoted by x fluxes by j. This is the dual space. And these uh, we have some constitutive relation between forces and fluxes and the inverse here. And the, the, the work, the power input or dissipation rate, it can be expressed either as a function of forces or fluxes given by the dot product of j and x. And this is non-negative definite. That is, it's never uh, negative. Um, uh, this doesn't rule out this instantaneous connection between forces and velocities or fluxes. Doesn't rule out history effects. Um, uh, we can have history dependence based on evolutionary uh, parameters. Um, so uh, uh, Adelin's contribution here was to generalize Onsager uh, 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 and Rayleigh's quadratic forms and um, show rigorously that 
uh, it, for this kind of system that the fluxes are always given by the gradient of a force potential plus an additional term and vice versa. Uh, these additional terms are powerless, as Adelin calls them, or gyroscopic. They, do, they, they exert no f work. And that's one of his contributions to show that such things can exist. Uh, if you know forces as a function of fluxes or vice versa, then you determine um, all these quantities. And if those gyroscopic terms are absent, uh, then you can uh, say that you have a hyperdissipative system as the analogy to hyperelastic, where you remember, uh, it's sometimes called green elastic, where stresses are given as, as derivatives uh, from, from of potential. Um, so we have a, an, an analogy here, which is actually very strong, as I'll show you later on. Um, those gyroscopic terms are a bit mysterious. They seem to represent some kind of irre uh, reversible coupling. And um, uh, I'm not going to, and most of the, it turns out most constitutive models don't have those. And so I'm not going to talk about them here. Uh, put, I listed some examples, uh, discrete networks of uh, resistors where uh, we have N uh, elements connected together in some way with voltage drops, uh, V sub alpha cur uh, currents, I sub alpha, and this defines the dissipation rate. For, and from this, we can get the dissipation potential. Same with networks of chemical reactions, which are usually regarded as dissipative. We have affinities, uh, the equivalent uh, analog of voltages, and we have rates, which are uh, ra uh, rates along select reaction pathways. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, viscoplastic continua, where we have stresses or hyperstresses uh, with conjugate kinematics and stress power. So if I have a nonpolar uh, polar medium, uh, we have a symmetric stress uh, which acts on the velocity gradient, which is denoted by uh, semicolon here. And uh, of course, all that uh, counts is the symmetric part of this, is the deformation rate. So the stress power is given by this expression, or the dissipation rate. Um, we have polar media, such as Kasserov media, which in addition to displacement have rotations associated with them. And uh, now we have uh, 18, uh, instead of six symmetric stresses, we have 18 quantities of stress, um, non-symmetric stress and a non-symmetric moment stress. And those, uh, the plus a circle here means the uh, linear, uh, the uh, uh, collection of these two quantities, or the uh, 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 direct sum. And the kinematics is given by a, a velocity gradient uh, plus, uh, in, and, and a, a gradient of, a, of the rotation, and the stress power is given by an expression like this. Uh, Prabhu Nath has written some, a couple of, at least two papers, on using this uh, viscoplastic Kassara models to regularize wall slip of granular materials in channels. Uh, that is, by regularizing, instead of having a sharp discontinuity, one has boundary layers at the walls, uh, and uh, that can be treated by this uh, idea. Uh, I'll make sure I'm on time here. Um, so, um, I'll go uh, just a bit of interesting history here. Um, the idea of uh, potentials um, go, go back at least to von Mises in the plasticity literature, where he um, used a quadratic yield surface uh, in stress space as a, a forced potential to get uh, plastic flow. Um, Rodney Hill and Cambridge gen uh, later generalized von Mises' treatment, uh, uh, did not assume uh, quadratic forms, and uh, in a remarkable paper here, he applied, he laid down principles, variational principles and so forth for uh, complex fluids uh, in a paper entitled New Frontiers in Solid Mechanics. Um, and finally, uh, in France, Jean-Jacques Moreau a uh, distinguished French mathematician simply postulated uh, uh, complex conjugate potentials 
so all of this work is nice, but it's, it's uh, in some sense phenomenological and not exactly rigorous. Um, then comes uh, Adeline. I, uh, this slide is, uh, I should have cut down on it, but uh, we can ignore most of it. Um, Edelin wrote a series of papers in the 1970s uh, which have been uh, highly neglected. Uh, at the time, uh, Keston at Brown University and uh, Jean Bataille, a French a postdoc, worked with Edelin to apply some of these ideas to chemical reactions, chemical kinetics. Uh, Mogin in France and uh, Erringen uh, both appreciated uh, Edelin's contribution, but they didn't apply it to anything. Uh, Edelin was a PhD of Erickson's at Hopkins and then later uh, professor of applied mathematics at uh, Lehigh and, uh, and a resident in uh, Ronald Rivlin's uh, Center for Mathematics. Um, by the way, um, if you look on um, Amazon, you will find a, a list, extensive list of Edelin's books on everything from exterior calculus to cosmology. He was an extraordinarily broad uh, thinker. <laughs> anyway, he, he pointed out that he, he derived these expressions that give the potentials in terms of the dissipation rates. Uh, he, he used the topological methods that used to derive um, Poincare's lemma uh, once you know the answer, you can do it with uh, standard vector calculus, as I showed in this uh, in uh, this article some years ago. Um, you have the the potential satisfy this uh, dual relation, and uh, psi corresponds roughly to a, is is essentially a Helmholtz potential, and phi is a kind of generalized Gibbs uh, fr uh, free energy or uh, dissipation potential. Um, we're going to focus on psi uh, largely here, uh, to, and I'll show you how you get the momentum balance for um, fluids with hyperstresses uh, from uh, that potential. Um, since forces are derived from uh, these potentials, if the, uh, the uh, my, my slides are not showing up here very nicely, um, if um, the potential is not convex, that means the derivatives will be non-monotone. And so stress versus strain rate, we can have a, a peak stress with failure afterwards, or we can have a situation where we can stabilize and have a, 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 a low strain rate state uh, coexisting with a high strain rate state. That's the condition for shear bands to have two different uh, uh, strain rate states that have the same stress. Uh, there's another kind of interesting uh, non-monotone uh, behavior, but I won't uh, talk about that here. Um, a more general view um, of this would be um, that we have the psi as a function of the vector, which is down here, uh, as a, if this is a hypersurface, if the area, if the region above that surface, the so-called epigraph is convex, then we say the function is convex. Um, the uh, normal to the level surfaces of psi uh, define the forces, and um, is, as shown here, uh, and if we have non-convexity, that means that we could have, for example, two different strain rates if, uh, or fluxes here and here, but they have the same, they have a common force. So uh, this is what gives rise to the uh, non-uniqueness of solutions and so forth. Um, you can uh, f formalize uh, further the... Uh, uh, Onsager symmetry by simply taking Onsager's linear relations, uh, which involve a conductance uh, or a resistance with uh, forces, uh, fluxes given in terms of forces and so forth. Um, if you, you simply replace the constant uh, res uh, conductance and resistance by functions of the force or the flux. And if those uh, 
matrices are symmetric, then we have nonlinear Onsager symmetry, and that corresponds to the absence of those uh, gyroscopic terms. Uh, the skew parts, the skew symmetric parts, uh, do not contribute to dissipation, but they rule out variational principles that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, a prominent example is the idea of a viscosity tensor, um, a fourth rank tensor that gives the stress, uh, Cauchy stress, in terms of velocity gradients. Um, I've been using that idea since 1984, uh, not being quite sure um, of um, the justification for it. And this is one of the reasons Edelin's work captured my uh, uh, attention is because this is simply a special case of these relations up here. Um, so you always have, for a viscoplastic fluid, you always have the equivalent of a, of a viscosity tensor, positive definite um, symmetric tensor. Um, and it can be, um, uh, have an, uh, depend on uh, uh, certain fabric uh, or, or structure tensors which evolve and, uh, and represent uh, flow-induced anisotropy. Uh, you have a nice nonlinear elastic analogy where if you replace fluxes by uh, strains, uh, Lagrangian strains, and uh, use the conjugate stresses, you can write down the same thing for elasticity. And this illustrates a very important relation between elasticity and uh, dissipation. And I've tried to uh, illustrate, I apologize, some of you have seen this picture. I've shown it now, I think, three times this year. And uh, I should make a New Year's resolution not to show it again in 2019, but everyone knows what happens to New Year's resolutions. Um, the point is that hyperdissipativity um, or strong dissipativity is the mirror image of, of hyperelasticity. Um, and this is remarkable. On one hand, you have a system in which nothing is lost, uh, nothing here being work. All the work you put into a system, you can get back. Um, this is Elijah going. Um, uh, ascending to from uh, where he came, um, everything is returned. And w on the other hand, we have a situation here uh, depicted by Bosch where everything is lost. All the work has dissipated. Uh, and what's remarkable is that these two extremes of physics are actually, uh, as I put here, c connected at the hip mathematically. Um, you have complementary potentials you have quasi-static extremum principles. Um, you have loss of convexity of the potential leading to material instability with shear banding, phase, tra phase transitions, and so forth. So um, I, th I think this is a, a, a very useful uh, way of, of visualizing some things. So the question is, what good is all this? <laughs> well. Um, for one thing, you get flow rules for classical plasticity and viscoplasticity relating stress to, uh, st uh, st to strain rate or vice versa. Uh, there's some possible applications to yield stress fluids where you normally treat the unyielded region as a rigid solid, but th there's no reason why you should not bring in the mechanics of the solid phase here, and especially in transient conditions, or if there's some instabilities involved. So I think there's some more that can be done with yield stress fluids based on these ideas. Um, you, uh, there's some really interesting uh, consequences of Onsager symmetry for viscoplastic drag laws. And I'll give you an example in a moment. Um, uh, very useful, the idea of these potentials very useful for formulating viscoplastic constitutive equations uh, involving thixotropy where you have evolution or parameters or internal variables that uh, uh, govern uh, the system. Uh, there are interesting variational approximations for viscoplastic flow of yield stress fluids. Uh, which have already been applied by several people, Prager, Hill, and Barris, and um, also Leonoff. Uh, 
have, uh, as a phenomenological proposition, applied these. Uh, Adelin's work makes this exact. Um, you can get balanced laws and field equations from uh, variational principles. And uh, the subject of this talk is really um, the, uh, it, uh, the incorporation of higher gradients to um, stabilize or regularize Hadamard instability. Um, this is, I won't spend too much time on this, this is um, an example of viscoplastic drag laws. If you take flow over a pattern surface with dissipative slip and you have a dissipative fluid, a viscoplastic fluid here, in the far, if there's no pressure gradient parallel to the surface, in the far field you will observe some apparent slip by extrapolating a linear velocity profile back to the surface and that apparent slip is related to the traction on a surface up here. Um, in the case of a, of a, Stokes, of a uh, uh, Stokes fluid, Stokesian fluid, uh, this is a linear relation between the apparent slip and the uh, stress. Um, you can simply generalize that with this idea of um, nonlinear Anzager coefficients, and um, show and and therefore the, you you have this relation now, a nonlinear relation between uh, slip and uh, stress. Uh, the same is true if we have internal flow in a porous medium with dissipative slip at the wall and uh, viscoplastic flow in the pores then you can generalize Darcy's law by having a flux that uh, depends on the pressure gradient. Uh, this would normally be uh, a linear function, but now you have a, a nonlinear function. So you can take practically any viscoplastic drag law that's uh, for a linear uh, fluid, a Newtonian fluid, and, 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 and immediately assume there's a generalization of it. Um, what about constitutive modeling? <laughs> well, um, many years ago in 1984, I suggested that if you said that a granular material was isotropic, you should be able to use the Reiner Rivlin fluid model, uh, uh, the well known Reiner Rivlin fluid model. Um, many of you will know that heroic efforts have been made over the years to. Uh, to uh, get these coefficients, to put restrictions on these coefficients, which depend on the scalar invariance of the strain rate, um, so that this is dissipative. Once you say it is dissipative, you have a dissipation potential that depends on the invariance of the strain rate, and you need do nothing else. You'll get this form correctly dissipative from uh, the derivatives of this with respect to strain rate. So you can throw away all those papers that uh, uh, a struggle to find uh, restrictions on these coefficients. They're given, they're determined by uh, a single scalar function of strain rate. Um, the, the mu of i model is simply this model without this term, the quadratic in strain rate. Uh, Professor Kakar talked about normal stresses. Well, this will give you a model with uh, z uh, zero second uh, primary normal stress and uh, with, sec uh, with second normal stresses. So um, you can uh, probably extend the mu of i model in some way to get these normal stresses if you're willing to neglect the, the primary normal stress. Um, you can get history dependent viscoplasticity by adding some parameters which are subject to evolution laws. Uh, for example, using some objective rate. This might be the fabric tensor. Um, and you can extend this to weakly non-local models with higher gradients. Uh, that's what I call uh, weakly non-local. So you simply have to say that this, the dissipation potential now depends on deformation rate and on uh, higher velocity gradients, in particular the, the first uh, gradient of velocity gradient. Um, when you do this, you'll generate stresses that are conjugate by the derivatives of this potential. The first stress is the Cauchy stress, it's the derivative with respect to strain rate. The second stress is a hyperstress, a three index quantity, 
that is the derivative of, the, of psi with respect to the gradient of the velocity gradient, double gradient of velocity. Um, so um, I'll make use of that um, shortly uh, to, um, uh, to, to uh, regularize the mu of i model. That's been discussed. Um, <coughs> Uh, what about extremum principles or variational principles? Uh, there's a, a popular idea in the literature of Ziegler, uh, due to Ziegler, which uh, instead of uh, using dissipation potentials, uses um, a, a gradients of dissipation rate itself. Uh, these are scalars here, so uh, this is proportional to the gradient of dissipation rate. And uh, the question is, what's the status of those, um, that idea, which is called the orthogonality principle? Uh, well, it, it turns out that this will give you the right answer for dissipation. If you dot x into this, uh, the numerator then cancels the denominator, and you get the dissipation rate exactly. Um, so it gives you the dissipation rate, and it gives you the dissipative components of stress, or, or uh, uh, force. Um, uh, unfortunately, there are other components, uh, non-dissipative, that are not the gyroscopic terms I referred to, but uh, you will miss those, and those are important in things like force balances. Um, if you have homogeneous potentials, then you will get the right answer from this. But if you have any kind of dissipation that is a sum of homogeneous potentials, this will give you the wrong answer. So conclusion is that if you want, uh, the variational principles have to be based on dissipation potentials, not dissipation rate. Entropy is not minimized or maximized. The, the, the entropy production. Uh, entropy is, is an equilibrium proposition, but entropy production is not maximized or minimized. It's the dissipation potential that is extremal. And uh, this is recognized again by uh, several workers and it, it's borne out by uh, Edlund's uh, theory. So this is the subject of my talk now. I hope I have, uh, how much time do I have about uh, Jim, uh, about 10? Uh, I can do it. Um, <coughs> so, um, how do we go about uh, uh, regularizing the mu? Uh, I, I didn't show you. Um, here's a suggestion of Hadamard instability of the mu of I model. Uh, There's a very nice paper in the Journal of Fluid Mechanics in 2015. Uh, the authors did numerical simulations with the mu-i model on a free surface flow of a granular material, and uh, this shows uh, pressure levels of, of pressure disturbances that arose in the simulations. And that suggests, um, as, as they point out, these get stronger and stronger the shorter the wavelength of the uh, disturbance, and that indicates Hadamard stability. And there are two ways you might modify the mu of i model, one based on some viscous effects or time scale effects, the other based on uh, length scale or uh, gradient effects, which is the approach uh, I'm proposing. So um, I, I'm going to skip that slide about um, um, variational uh, De derivations for the momentum balance and, and go right here to the constitutive equation. So what, uh, one of the things you can do is, is make an analogy to the famous con hilliard equation of uh, thermodynamics where instead of gradient of velocity we have fluid density here and we have gradient of fluid density here. So with the, uh, the Helmholtz free energy involves the term uh, non-convex depending on a density that leads to have, uh, instability, and then we have a, an energy penalty on gradients. Uh, in our case, a dissipation uh, a penalty uh, that uh, serves to uh, uh, regularize things. Uh, this actually gives rise, this term in the case of uh, 
the uh, Van der Waals Cotton Hilliard model, this term gives rise to surface tension and it gives rise to a diffuse interface instead of a sharp interface that has a length scale associated with it. Um, you can get, in the same way, a viscoplastic surface tens tension from this hyperstress uh, that gives you a dissipative analog of uh, an elastic surface tension. There's a better analogy than Con Hilliard. Uh, Minlin uh, worked out a theory for elasticity many years ago, uh, uh, gradient elasticity. And, uh, well, I did mention, uh, you, I, I'll go over this very quickly. You can get the momentum balance with these extra stresses by first of all doing a minimum dissipation potential that gives you uh, here pressure. This is an incompressible fluid, so this is the incompressibility constraint. And this is the body force. So if you minimize this quantity, it will give you the quasi-static momentum balance, which follows from a, a variational principle. Uh, however, to get the full momentum balance with inertia, you have to then apply D'Alembert's principle that says I can replace this body force by uh, 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 whatever other body force I might have and a fluid inertia term. This is Einstein's elevator principle also. Uh, so you, you now in two steps you get the correct momentum balance and it involves the divergence of a stress which however is not the Cauchy stress. It's the Cauchy stress plus the divergence of the hyperstress. It comes into the momentum balance in the same way. And uh, you can generalize this to higher order terms. Um, so what does this extra term here do for you? Well, it, if you look at the momentum balance, uh, the, this is the uh, substantial derivative, uh, the d sub t. If you look at the uh, momentum balance, that gives you, um, this term is with the regular mu of i model, and the, uh, this additional term gives you a fourth order uh, der, uh, gradient of, of velocity. And this term actually then serves to, it becomes important for very high gradients or very short wavelengths and serves to uh, regularize uh, things. Um, if you do a linear stability analysis on the full momentum balance, then you wind up with this mess uh, the black terms were those considered in the analysis of Barker. This additional term is, uh, comes from the higher gradient effect. And these terms have to do with convection effects that were neglected by uh, Barker. Uh, I won't, I'm, I'm not going to talk about those here. Uh, they, they involve uh, something called Kelvin wave vector stretching. Uh, and, uh, and that actually turns out to be important uh, in a transient way. Um, in the course of this work, I came across this classic paper by Felix Browder, which shows that Hadamard instability is all decided by what's on the right-hand side of this equation. In other words, we don't really have to look at inertia. Um, we can decide on the basis of the operator uh, appearing on this side of the equation uh, as to uh, 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 Hadamard stability. And it's simply if this uh, operator loses general ellipticity, then you have uh, uh, this instability. If you're, uh, so you, you really don't, if, if, if your goal is just to ask about Hadamard instability, you don't need to solve any problem. You just need to look at this linearized uh, right hand side of this equation. Um, so, um, but if you're interested in dynamics, then um, you can uh, do the uh, dynamical analysis as Barker et al. did. And so here's the effect of this parameter chi, the gradient term. If it's zero, we get a stability diagram in wave number space. This is for a shear flow uh, in the one direction. Uh, this is the w component of wave vector in that direction. This is the component of the wave vector in the second direction. Um, we've put everything in Fourier space here. So the unstable regions are in here. These directions in wave number space are unstable and uh, they, they grow with, um, they grow um, 
the uh, growth rate here, uh, it, it, the growth goes like e to the lambda t, and lambda goes like k squared if chi is equal to zero, if this gradient effect is negligible, and that was the Hadamard instability found by Barker and, and uh, colleagues. On the other hand, as you crank up this gradient term, you s begin to reduce the area of instability, and finally, you, you can reduce it to a very small value. This, this provides terms that are k to the fourth, the magnitude of the wave vector fourth power that uh, come into play and cut off the k squared, the unstable terms. Uh, this shows some effects of the convection term, and I won't um, dwell on that except to say that they, those convection terms modify the stability uh, region. They cut out certain directions of instability. And in fact, you can show that uh, Kelvin wave vector stretching uh, will eventually quench the instability. But in the meantime, uh, the, the uh, amplitudes can get very large. So this is not a terribly important effect. Here's a summary of um, using the diagram uh, proposed by uh, Barker and, uh, and colleagues um, of uh, the stability. This delta mu is the difference between the friction coefficient at, uh, in the mu of i model at low uh, i and the limiting friction coefficient at large i. If this is zero, then we have a model with constant friction. Um, and um, that would be always unstable uh, here. The, uh, this is the stability region, according to Barker and company, for chi equals zero. And if we're out here, especially if low delta mu, uh, we're always unstable. On the other hand, when we put these gradient terms in, the instability region gets pushed outside these curves here. So out here we're unstable, but we're now stable uh, even for delta mu equals zero for constant friction. And uh, as chi goes up, we keep pushing the unstable region further to the right. Um, so uh, that's the uh, upshot of this uh, gradient regularization. Um, and I've defined here, I, I see that I did define delta mu up here. Um, so let me summarize. <coughs> um, uh, the idea of dissipation potentials uh, are really useful for uh, dissipa formulating dissipative constitutive equations and the associated balance laws. And there are very nice analogies to elastic uh, systems or thermodynamic equilibrium systems. Um, higher gradient uh, versions of uh, dissipation potentials uh, can regularize short wavelength instabilities. And as shown in a paper which will appear very shortly by uh, uh, some colleagues, not, not myself, um, th these uh, gradient terms also can produce shear bands uh, with a diffuse thickness related to the magnitude of the gradient term. So not only can you stabilize Hadamard instabilities, you can have the instability show up as a shear band, which now becomes stable, doesn't grow, and has a fixed uh, thickness. Um, here's some connection to other work. Uh, these weakly non-local models that go in series of gradients of velocity um, are approximations to a much better fully non-local models, such as uh, the granular fluidity model proposed recently by Cameron and his co-workers. And these models also regularize Hadamard instability. They have, they have length scale effects associated with them. In fact, they have divergent length scales as you approach the yield surface uh, the, as I goes to zero. So, um, um, uh, these are more difficult to use and maybe not always necessary, but they're somewhat, in some sense more comprehensive. Uh, recently, uh, a, a couple of papers have appeared um, trying to get rid of the Hadamard instability by time scale effects, by putting in viscous effects. Well, what happens is in order to do this, you must get rid of the yield stress. 
the origin of the problem is really the yield stress. And we already know from solid mechanics that uh, plasticity, perfect plasticity, has a tendency to be not unique and to have uh, shear bands. So uh, in some sense, these works that uh, repl wind up replacing viscous effects at low I uh, by uh, uh, replacing yield stress effects by viscous effects. Once you've done that, then you've opened up the arena to all kinds of competing viscous models. You, you, don't know, you no longer uh, should just focus on mu I. There are better models, for example, uh, possibly better models such as Jenkins Savage or Jenkins Bersey, recent models of dense kinetic theory. So uh, in some sense, you're throwing out the baby with the bathwater when you throw out yield stress. Uh, from, uh, for yield stress fluids. Uh, so that's my uh, message. I thank you for your attention, and uh, uh, I'll answer any questions you might ask. You'll have to excuse me. My uh, hearing is uh, not great, so. Okay, thanks. Can you hear me fine? <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask about uh, when can you expect there to be a dissipative potential? Is it, you've shown that it's a great aid to developing constitutive equations, but... I'm you, sorry, it's... You, you've shown that having a dissipative potential really helps in developing a constitutive equation. Right. But should we um, But they have to be, your, your material has to be strictly dissipative. Yes, but let's say it is. Yeah. Strictly dissipative. When can we expect that there will be a dissipative potential, and when will there not be? You'll always have, the beauty of Idlin's work is, uh, you'll always have a, dissipative, a dissipation potential for strictly dissipative systems. So you can always... You can always assume that. You can always assume the equivalent of uh, viscosity tensors, uh, resistance tensors that are nonlinear. This is the real... Uh, power of what he, he, his treatment. Everything up to then was kind of phenomenological, and, and he did it in a, in a beautifully precise mathematical way. So, and uh, if you have a system that has elastic effects, then you might appeal to another solid mechanics idea. There's something called the generalized standard model in France, which is two potentials. You have an elastic potential and the dissipation potential. That's the idea of the spring in the dash pot. Generalized, you have two potentials. So, in fact, you could argue that any viscoelastic system will be a kind of network of dissipative elements with their potential and elastic elements with their potential. So you can do nonlinear viscoelasticity of uh, networks this way as a generalization of the old uh, Blizzard uh, ladder networks and so forth. So uh, you just have to be sure that the part you're focusing on is purely dissipative, and then you're always sure that you'll have a dissipation potential. Yeah. Pardon. Yeah. Thank thank you. I'd like to follow up a little bit with the nonlinear. When you do the regularization, you end up with terms that are higher order gradients in the yeah. velocity. Yeah. Uh, is there any scenario where you would end up with gradients of the stress itself as Yes, as you can turn this around. Uh, I haven't done it. Um, in the, in the uh, solid mechanics literature, um, back many years ago, uh, a man named Ifantis did this with plasticity. He, he developed gradient plasticity theories that involve higher gradients of the stress. So you can do this. I'm not sure exactly how I would fit it in. I haven't tried this. It's, it's easier to do the kinematics since you're doing gradients. But uh, yes, the answer is you can. There, there are generalizations that involve stress gradients. Okay. Thank you. Joe, I have a question about a detail of your higher gradient extension, yeah. uh, where you use a dissipation potential to get the higher gradient. But if you look at the first term, the, the very first term in the stress, yeah. 
which is the classical Cauchy stress. Yeah. Is there a dissipation potential from which you, you can determine the first term? Um, because that one is rate independent. Yeah, and I it's assume, singular in the limit of... Uh, uh, very good question. I assume that this chi in the model is right. not dependent on the first term. It was just a constant. But you can make it a function of the strain rate. So, I mean, you, you really, I, I just, I assumed a very simple model, but right. you can take a general model where the potential depends on, in an arbitrary way, on both gradients, first velocity gradient, second velocity gradient. Sure, but the first term in the stress is singular you're, you're, in the limit. Uh, you're referring to psi zero, the first. Yes, it, yeah. yes. Now, the, the stress corresponding to psi zero is singular in the limit of the strain rate going to zero. I'm sorry? The, f the very first term in the stress. Um, that's that's which, just the ordinary mu of i or uh, potential that goes. I didn't show the potential for mu of i, but that's, that just depends on the... Uh, yeah, okay. I guess we can talk about this later. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, sh I skipped that slide, actually, because I was f uh, out of fear for time. But you can write down the dissipation potential for mu of i and you find out that it's marginally convex. It's not, it's not non-convex, but it's marginally convex. And in, in my view, that's what gives rise to the Hadamard instability. Joe, uh, the introduction of higher spatial gradients requires the consideration of additional boundary conditions. <laughs> Another very good question. Um, it's been raised by other talented people. Um, yes, if you, if you want to now solve boundary value problems when you've introduced higher gradients, you need other boundary conditions. The hope is that you're locally stabilizing things and then the effect of boundaries will be possibly some boundary layers or stuff like that. That's, and so one hopes that the boundary conditions are not too important. By the way, this is also the problem with the Cameron granular fluidity model, they have a Helmholtz equation and they have to assume some boundary conditions on it. So anytime you put higher gradients, you're faced with this problem. So, and, and that's a very important uh, practical consideration to look at. Very, very good point. If there are no other, oh, one more question. Uh, so if you look at the MUI curve, the instability, the Hadman instability that you're talking about is important only... Can, can you repeat, Jim, for me? I've, uh, my, uh, I'm cutting out. I can't. Oh. Is, it, is the stability that you're concerned with only important near the yield stress? Yes. No, uh, it's, it's not. It's, it, well, there's two uh, sort of yield stresses. There's one in the MUI model. Mm -hmm. There's a limiting lower friction coefficient and limiting higher, and both are important. Both contribute to the ins instability because they involve regions of constant mu, and that's where the, com the, where the problem comes, where the friction is constant. So if I don't have a constant mu, then that instability is not there, right? Beg pardon? If he doesn't have a constant mu, yeah. then the instability is not there. Um, yeah, if you don't have a constant, that's what the trick is that these people use to put in viscosity. They let mu depend on I everywhere. So you, it's viscous stabilization. And, uh, <laughs> thank you, Joe. Yeah, thank Can we thank Joe again?